If you looked at the thumbnail or if you looked at the uh, opening screen, you saw that it was a picture of, in fact, the second coming. So that kind of gives away the game that the signs of the times are, of course, with respect to the second coming. Now, um, a little bit of a caveat, which is uh, I have more that I want to talk about about this than will fit gracefully in a single episode. So it's uh, divided into at least two. And the next one, which I am currently planning to have live streamed on this Sunday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, will in some sense be the more exciting one. It'll probably be called something like uh, the demonic and the end times. Uh, this one is more laying the groundwork of, uh, frankly, what we know from church teaching about the times to precede the second coming, with, of course, some observations um, that may be uh, suggesting that it's not that far off. Uh, please excuse me a another moment while I just there verify that everything looks okay. There. So, okay. First of all, almost the most important thing, um, very important from the point of view of just being sane in this world and also from the point of view of understanding God and man and um, the role of the Catholic Church in the relationship between God and man is the fact that this world is going to end. That's non-negotiable. That's dogma. That appears throughout the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, actually. And... Um, it's recited, we even say in the creed, every time we say the creed, we say that, well, I'll just read that line. Um, well, I'll read the creed, okay? For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Jesus will come back will come back in glory. We're right about the time of the ascension. It's a, it's a good time to be aware of this when he left the disciples on Ascension Thursday and went up to heaven. Remember the angels who um, made themselves present in that circle of disciples who were looking up to heaven to see Jesus ascending on the cloud saying, you know, and the, those angels said, why are you looking up there? You know, he's about, he's going to come back from where he came from. And he is going to come back, and that's going to be the second coming. And when the second coming happens, life as we know it on earth will go away. And in fact, earth as we know it will go away. And I will try to make the argument that the entire physical universe as we know it will go away. Now, let me just, throughout this teaching, I want to try to be scrupulous in separating out what's actually dogma and what is a reasonable picture that's consistent with the dogma based on the dogma, but fills out the dogma in places where the dogma doesn't go, which means any place that's filled out, uh, basically, you don't have to believe it's not dogma. Uh, it's kind of opinion. 
So the dogma is, however, that Jesus will come again and that this world will pass away. The reason I'm being so careful here is that there are a lot of details about the sequence of these events which are open to different interpretations and do not have a dogmatic explanation, you know, uh, kind of nailed down, You, this has been revealed truth and there's no contesting it. And so let me just try to make myself coherent. So that Jesus will come again, that's dogma, that's certain. This world will end, that's certain. That there will be a, at that time a general judgment when the, as it said in the creed, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. There'll be a general judgment in which all of the dead, as well as all of the living, will be called together to a, for the dead, a second judgment. For the living, perhaps it's the first judgment. I'll talk about that in a moment. That's all dogma. What isn't dogma is um, how simultaneous these things will be. And it is an acceptable opinion to think that uh, there will be a time, a time period between the second coming and the end of the world and the general judgment. That's, that's an acceptable opinion within the Catholic Church. Um, it's not my opinion, but my opinion is just my opinion. I'm trying to distinguish my opinion from, from what is actually known. So anyway, so um, let me just uh, then go on. Okay, so there, I, I brought, up, brought up three elements, so to speak, of the end of the world. The second coming itself, when Jesus returns, the general judgment, and the world ending. So let me just address those a little bit separately. Um, <laughs> excuse me for saying this. You're welcome to tune out if this is dull, because this is all just intended to provide a backdrop for the more fun stuff, in some sense, in the next, uh, in the next live stream. Anyway, but the general judgment, because a lot of people are confused about this. When we die, we have the particular judgment. We newly died, um, are basically presented before Jesus, and our souls are judged, and Jesus determines whether we um, immediately go to heaven, which is an extremely rare occurrence, whether we go to hell, which is a far too frequent occurrence, even if it's only occurred once, it's too frequent, but if you take the Gospels seriously, it certainly sounds like it happens a lot more than that. Also, by the way, if you take, for instance, the um, apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary or the um, at, uh, at Fatima, oh, the, she showed the Fatima children, and I think Lucia described it, that um, the souls were falling into hell like the autumn leaves falling off of trees. Another visionary saint said it looked like snowflakes falling down the the massive number of souls that were falling into hell. I'm not preaching that, but there you have those visions. Um, so anyway, at the particular judgment, our judgment is sealed, whether we go immediately to heaven, whether we go immediately to hell, or whether we are on our way to heaven, but require more purification in purgatory. So that's the particular judgment. So basically the general judgment doesn't change our fate. However, at the end of the world, there will then be this general judgment where all of the human souls throughout history are called together and in some sense simultaneously, Not, I, I don't know how that's going to work, but in the presence of each other, they see the um, consequences of their actions, the consequences of other people's actions and their judgment and the other people's judgment. So basically, the point of this is just imagine that um, you were very wicked and you let a lot of people into sin and you die and you're condemned. It's a terrible thing, right? Then at the ju general judgment, every human soul who ever lived will see just how bad you were and you and they will see not only your condemnation, but the thousands of people perhaps who indirectly were lost, souls that were lost because of your sin, in other words, because of 
you know, people that you led into sin, people that the people that you led into sin led into sin and so forth. And uh, the happier news is that if one spent one's life well, and not only saved one's own soul, but perhaps one saved other people's souls as well, at which point at the, at the general judgment, excuse me, we will be able to see not only, of course, our judgment, which has already taken place, but we'll be able to see all of the souls that ended up in heaven because of what we did and all of the souls that ended up in heaven because of what they did and so forth and so on. So one can only imagine a saint like St. Francis of Assisi or St. Ignatius of Loyola at the general judgment for all we know they will see that tens of millions of souls perhaps ended up in heaven because of how they spent their lives. So that's in a nutshell kind of the difference between the general judgment and the particular judgment. The general judgment is not like an appeals court where maybe you got convicted in the lower court, but the conviction gets overturned in the appeals court. That's not the general judgment. I am going to take a little bit of a moment and see what the uh, comments are saying, just in case I haven't been clear. Oops, turn up the volume. Sound is fine for me, sound is good, sound good here. Okay, well, I guess I won't turn up the volume since a lot of people, maybe I'll turn it up a little bit, uh, but I don't want to distort either, so so I have to do this with a little bit of di uh, discretion. There. Um, yeah, maybe I'll turn it up a little more than that. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, if it distorts, I'm sure you'll let me know. Um, okay. Somebody just asked the question of what's my opinion of Father Michel, uh, who seems to be a very saintly man, I believe in Canada, a priest who has been talking a lot about, I don't know how to put it, the end times we're entering on to and what people should do. And I will talk about that probably in the next episode more directly. But for now, let me just say, I want to lay a foundation which is essentially dogma. In other words, it is free from private revelation because private revelation can never become dogma or it doesn't, it isn't dogma. Uh, dogma is restricted to uh, divine revelation, public revelation, which comes about in one of two ways, either through the sacred scriptures or through the magisterium of the church. So I'm going to stay away from, from private revelation, at least for this episode, um, because it would take me too far afield. Anyway, okay, so that was the general judgment, particular judgment. Now, um, the end of the world and what awaits us, okay? This is a little bit parallel in a way to the general judgment and the particular judgment. Because, of course, when we die, after we die, um, we have heaven to look forward to, let's hope. And, um, you know, again, a life without any death, I mean, an eternal life, I mean, 100 million years isn't even a drop in the bucket, right? We live forever, we live in pure bliss, we live in a ecstasy of love, which we can't even imagine, uh, an ecstasy of intimacy with God, uh, and, and actually wisdom and knowledge and, um, as I said, we, we literally, we can't imagine it. Um, if you watch my witness testimony, you know I had a little, 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 little taste of it in my conversion experience. And uh, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's a pure ecstasy greater than we could ever imagine. And that has nothing to do with the end of the world. The world doesn't have to end. Our, our lives are going to end and we're going to have the possibility of heaven. Um, however, when the end of the world comes, essentially there will only be heaven and hell and there will not be life on earth as we know it. There won't be any, any place in the world, any, any place in humanity of birth and life and suffering and testing and so forth. There will only be these two conditions which are the people who made it to heaven, the souls who made it to heaven, who are in this uninterrupted bliss for all eternity, and the souls which were lost. Now, 
So in, in that sense, if you just look at it from the perspective of the individual soul, it's very hard to um, nail down a distinction between the heaven that awaits us after we die and the new Jerusalem, I'll call it, the, the world after the end of the world. Um, there is a very big distinction, which is the resurrection of the body, that, that's, that you know, as of now, um, I believe it is dogma that Jesus, I'm pretty sure it's dogma to tell the truth, that uh, Jesus is um, reun has his resurrection body, essentially, that he is not waiting for the resurrection of the dead to have his full form in heaven. The Blessed Virgin Mary, of course, the assumption is that she ascended into heaven, body and soul. So she isn't awaiting the resurrection of the body to um, be complete in heaven. However, uh, those are the only two cases we know for certain. Arguments can be made about St. Joseph, arguments can be made about Elijah and Enoch and so forth, but the vast majority of us, perhaps all of the rest of us, will have to wait for the end of the world before we're reunited with our bodies in heaven. However, I'm going to kind of skate past that because I have no idea what that means. And I don't want to pretend to know what that means. And if, if anyone knows what that means and how things will be different, when we're reunited with our bodies, I'm trying to say, let me know. I have actually read the standard things about it, you know, like St. Thomas, and I still can't make heads or tails out of it. So anyway, however, so whatever the differences between our lives in heaven after the end of this world, we know that this world will end. Now, I want to talk about that a little bit. Why will this world end? The reason this world will end is because the entire purpose of the entire created world and I believe this includes space-time. This includes the, all of the laws of physics that we, we know in the universe are part of the created world. And the entire created world, hundreds of thousands of galaxies, you know, countless billions of light years of space, you know, God knows what, all of the laws of physics, all of the, um, you know, atoms in the universe, all of the elements, the way everything is woven together, you know, gravity and, and energy and, and time and, and uh, magnetism and light, all of those things, they were created for one purpose, which was to enable human souls to be created and go through this time of testing on earth and end up for all eternity blissfully in heaven with God. And when the preordained number of human souls have been created, when the population of heaven reaches the population that God always intended for heaven, then there is no purpose to the created world anymore. And the created world will end. There will be no more human souls created because the right number of human souls will already be in heaven. Um, okay, let me go on. I, I'm going to be dancing back and forth a little bit today because, um, who knows why, because it's a complicated topic or because I'm disorganized, one of those things. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. A comment. Yeah. The reason I'm, I'm giving this teaching is because many of us go to church every Sunday and we haven't heard a whole lot of teaching on is called eschatology on on the end of the world eschatology has two meanings the word eschatology both means the last things in our lives heaven you know death heaven hell purgatory and it also means the end of the world and we have to be aware that the world is going to end for a number of reasons one is all of the concern now you know i try to stay away from being political but let's say that global warming was true, a man-made global warming. And let's say, uh, well, we know something else is true. We know that entropy is true. We know that the universe is running down. We know that the sun will burn out in however many millions of years. We actually know that the universe will be used up in who knows how many billions of years. That's nothing to be concerned about because it was never intended to last forever. And even if, let's say, the earth was being used up, 
And because of one thing or another or another, for instance, global warming, if that was in fact the case, let's say the Earth would only last another 100 years or 200 years. I mean, I'm not saying that we should be, you know, blithely, you know, kind of irresponsible about it. But the fact remains, we don't know whether it was ever intended to even last beyond that. In other words, we don't know whether the second coming will happen before then. And basically, physical existence has an expiration date. The Earth has an expiration date. We don't know what that expiration date is, but we know it has an expiration date. So I'm trying to not look like a ghoul with this little reading light, but I'm failing miserably. So maybe I'll try something else. Okay. So um, let me read some of the scriptures. I actually can't do without it. Uh, let me read some of the scriptures um, that, that uh, talk about the end of the world and the new heaven and the new earth. Um, the, uh, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I have this new, I'm trying to, you know, kind of get a little bit more sophisticated in my, in my technology here. So I'm going to be reading from... Um, Book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men, he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither there shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the fountain of the water of life without payment. He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So... Um, those are, you know, words from the book of Revelation. They certainly sound like they're the words of Jesus. And, um, there isn't too much that has to be explained about these or added to this. The, the, um, the new Jerusalem, the, the world, the universe existence after this world has passed away will be one of, um, intimate presence of God, intimate union with God. It will be one of bliss with no, no birth, no death, no aging, no decay, no work, no suffering, no toil, just bliss. And um, the one who sat upon the throne said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, which is very beautiful because, of course, the entire universe was created by Jesus, by Christ, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity brought the universe into existence. And so he was the um, creator of the universe and he is the end of the universe. He is the goal of the universe. He is the union with him in this spousal union is the ultimate end of the universe. So he very literally is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. Alpha being the first letter of the Greek alphabet and omega being the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Um, and then I guess the only other thing I'll add is it's not, frankly, when Jesus talks about heaven, he almost always also talks about hell. It is not a slam dunk that every human soul will end up in heaven. Uh, the purpose of life on earth is a testing period, a trial period. You know, you know, when, when, you know, when, when, cars come off the assembly line, you know, they're, they go through quality control. They get tested, right, to see if they're going to fall apart or the wheels are going to fall off or something. 
the purpose of life on earth is a kind of quality control for heaven. There would be no me purpose, to, there would be no need for life on earth if every human soul which was created was going to end up in heaven because there'd be no need for quality control. This is actually a true story, totally irrelevant. But I had a professor at Harvard Business School who was a consultant for Honda uh, Motor Company when they still made all the Hondas in Japan. And he went over there and inspected their, fa their factory and he saw the cars coming off the assembly line and there was a quality control check. And uh, his name was Professor Spence, uh, who was acting as his consultant. And Professor Spence went over to the guy doing the quality control test and said to him, what's the percentage of failures? How many cars fail the quality control? And the tester said, uh, zero, it's, it's never happened. Anyway, life on earth isn't like that. It's not a quality control from which, uh, you know, none will probably fail, okay? So in this, in this incredibly, it's the book of Revelation, it's Revelation 21. It's the second to the last chapter, I think, in the entire Bible. And uh, Jesus, I don't want to say he sticks the needle in, but he does make a point. He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot is something very different, okay? So that's what this is all about, okay? Um, okay, now uh, there was something else uh, I was going to say, which uh, slipped my mind. For the moment, um, so I will simply I will simply uh, go on. Oh yes, here's here's something to add, because again, um, it is uh, it's in the next chapter. I, I better I better change um, uh, change the screen since I'm no longer on Revelation uh, 21, um, <laughs> um, which is I, I mentioned in an earlier talk about that beautiful, beautiful parable in Matthew 22 of the king who um, is hosting a wedding feast for his son and he invites all of his friends and family and neighbors and they're all too busy, they don't want to come, they have this to do, they have that to do. He gets The king gets very angry at them and he tells his servants, go out into the streets and recruit, you know, every vagrant and bum and hoi polloi and nobody on the street and invite them to the wedding feast instead of the guests that it was originally intended for. So they all come, they're all delighted. And then the king sees one without a wedding garment. And he says very angrily, how did you get in without a wedding garment? And he tells his servants to throw them out where they'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth and so forth. And this seems on the surface, it seems so unfair. But in fact, that wedding garment is the state of grace. It's basically the, the soul having been cleansed of sin. And that we know as Catholics, if you die in a state of mortal sin, your eternity is in a great deal of jeopardy. And if you die in a state of grace, your eternity is assured. So the state of grace is essentially the wedding garment. So having said that, let me go back to Revelation, now chapter 22. And verse 14, and we're talking about this eternal heaven, right? Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Okay, so you have the same image, right? Blessed are they who wash their robes. Blessed are the ones invited to the wedding feast that have washed their robes, are wearing the wedding garment, are dressed in white, are in a state of grace because they will be invited in to the wedding feast. And uh, in this Revelation 22 metaphor, they will have the right to the tree of life. Remember the Garden of Eden, paradise, the tree of life, Adam and Eve were kicked out of. These people will be back in, in paradise. They will have the right to the tree of life um, and they may enter the city by the gates. They're welcome in. However, continuing with Revolution, Revelation 22, Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and fornicators and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So again, the same little sobering wake up call, almost exactly like in the previous chapter. OK, um, I hope I'm not a doom and gloom preacher. I'm not. I hope I'm not. 
I find this entire story incredibly, incredibly happy. However, another little digression. Um, I got a comment on, on one of my YouTube videos that I put up on, on Holy Week, one of these live streams, um, from a, let me just say, a, a gentleman suffering from same-sex attraction disorder. And he was very angry, and he said that um, I called homosexuality depravity, I'm being completely unkind and uncharitable. To homosexuals. Now, I think it's the opposite. I think the greatest charity imaginable is helping somebody get to heaven instead of get lost. I mean, in other words, instead of having their soul lost, instead of ending up in hell. And I think the greatest lack of charity is not doing anything. Uh, the, the spiritual act of mercy in the Catholic Church is known as reproving the sinner. Reproving the sinner is a spiritual act of mercy. In other words, it's not doing, if somebody is on their way to perdition, it is hardly an act of charity to slap them on the back and say, you have nothing to worry about, just keep doing what you're doing. And it's a hardly a failure of charity to say, you might want to look at what Jesus said, and you might want to look at the laws of the Catholic Church, in fact, the rules of the Catholic Church, the dogma of the Catholic Church, the words of the scriptures, and you might want to ask yourself whether you're jeopardizing your salvation by the choices you're making. I don't think that's a lack of charity. I think that's charity. Anyway, that's all a digression, I suppose. Um, so more about the end of the world, okay? Um, now, uh, yes, Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. That is true. But in the very same passage, he also said, don't be hypocrites, because when you see the fig tree burst into blossom, you know that spring is near. And likewise, when you see these things that are, I'm telling you about, the signs that precede the second coming, similarly, you should be able to read the signs of the times. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll get to those signs of the, those signs in a moment. I'll just mention them very briefly now because I just did, which is by dogma, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, actually the two catechisms of the Catholic Church, we know four things that have to precede the second coming. There ha the gospel has to be spread throughout the world. Um, there has to be great apostasy, a widespread falling away from the faith. The Antichrist has to make an appearance. And... Um, there has to be a widespread conversion of the Jews. Sorry about that. Um, and so those are the four things that we know for certain have to precede the second coming, the signs, so to speak. Um, however, let me get go back to talking about what we know about the heavenly Jerusalem. And now I'm going to read from 2 Peter 3. So if I can use my new toy again, there we go, 2 Peter 3. Uh, um, this is now verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. See, that's because it will come suddenly. There's another passage in which I think Jesus says it'll be like no, the flood in the days of Noah, that people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage when all of a sudden it came. When the second coming happens, it will catch most people unawares. It'll come like a thief in the night. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved by fire. Remember that line, and the elements will be dissolved by, by fire, excuse me, with fire. And the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. So not just the earth, uh, not just the works upon the earth, not just the things that are upon the earth, but the earth itself will be burned up. Um, uh, you are to live out your lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Okay, also very interesting. You are to hasten the day of the coming of the Lord. That music that I played just before I came on the air was um, Harpa Dei chanting over and over again, 
come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. That's why I chose that clip. We are, we are told in scripture to pray to hasten that day, the coming of the Lord. We are to pray that the second coming come sooner rather than later. I'm not saying this. St. Peter, the first Pope, is saying it. Uh, he's saying, we are to live out lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Okay? So we should be praying that, that they come, come quickly. And there's another passage um, in which Jesus says, I think it's Luke 21, but I could be wrong, where Jesus says, um, basically, uh, oh, oh boy, I, I actually have it somewhere. I'm not going to bother looking right now. Um, woe to those in those days. Uh, woe to those who are living in those days. Um, things will be so terrible that the living will envy the dead. Um, and even the elect would have been lost, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Okay. In other words, things will be so bad that the days have to be shortened to keep even the elect from being lost. In other words, the souls that, you know, God intends for heaven from being lost. That's another reason to pray for hastening the second coming, right? Because the sooner the second coming happens, the shorter the period of trial and tribulation preceding the second coming will be. So that's an exhortation to, you know, pray, come Lord Jesus, like that lovely religious community, Harpa Dei, we're singing over and over again in English and Spanish and Latin, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. Uh, maybe I'll uh, play that again. I don't mean, maybe I'll take a short break um, and, uh, and, and resume that, uh, that music. Anyway, so anyway, back to uh, Second Peter. Um, okay, you are to live out lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be kindled and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire. According to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Okay, no sin or suffering. Righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you wait for these, be zealous to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Is this depressing or is this incredibly cheerful? I can't help seeing it as incredibly cheerful, okay? Whatever we see, and this is another reason why it's really important to preach about the second coming. We know the second coming is going to happen. We know that the second coming is going to usher in not only a return to the Garden of Eden, but a, a far improved version of a return to the Garden of Eden. So it's going to be the greatest thing, most wonderful thing that ever happened. You know, we know what we have to do to benefit from it, to partake of it. That's all really good news. We also know that's going to precede it, be preceded by the worst time ever on earth. And what's that mean? That means that if we are so blessed as to be living in the end times, maybe even living such that we will be alive when Jesus comes again. If we are so blessed to be living in the end times, things are going to look like everything has gone to hell in a handbasket right before the second coming. We know that. That's dogma. So what this all means is if it looks like evil has completely taken over the world, if it looks like everything is hopeless, if it looks like God is nowhere to be seen, you know, if it looks worse than it's ever looked before in human history, we should actually rejoice because what it means is this is God's plan unfolding and the second coming is around the corner. Okay, so we are in dark times. Uh, I'll talk more about that in the next show, but that's why I'm doing this actually is because it's the signs of the times. I, I think things are going to probably get a lot darker. I think we're seeing it now. Okay, I'm going to get a little political. Um, I guess I'm finished with uh, with second uh, second Peter, so I better better get rid of that screen. Um, whoops, wrong button, wrong magic button. That's the right magic button. Um, look at what's happening with the uh, coronavirus. There's talk, you know. I don't know if it's true or not. I mean, I know that the talk is true, but I don't know if the prediction is true. But there are people 
who want the solution, so to speak, to the coronavirus to be mandatory universal vaccination. And um, only people who are vaccinated will be permitted out of their houses. And how are you going to know who's vaccinated? Maybe they'll be implanted with a chip that can be read actually from a distance, read by 5G towers or read from satellites or read by scanners, you know, every time you, you know, go through a toll booth or go into a store or something. Okay, at which point that would be a pretty neat mark of the beast without which you couldn't buy or sell. Um, the, the, there's clearly a push on for a one world government. Um, there's clearly a push on for, frankly, enslaving humanity. And if we should actually live to see it not just be a dry run, but to see something like this unfolding, rejoice and be glad because it means the second coming is around the corner. OK, we just have to keep our nose clean, noses clean. So um, that's how this all ties together. Um, and since I've gone down that road, I could talk forever. So I thank you very much for for watching and listening um, at all. I don't know. I mean, thank you for putting up with me. Anyway, since I've gone down that road, let me talk about one other thing we know that has to precede the second coming. We know it dogmatically. We know it from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and that is the coming of the Antichrist. And um, the uh, let me find uh, the relevant... Uh, some anti uh, antichrist scripture quotes okay uh, this is from second thessalonians saint paul's second letter to the thessalonians now concerning the coming of our lord jesus the second coming we beg you brethren not to be quickly shaken in mind or excited to the effect that the day of the lord has come for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Okay, so that's, that's the Antichrist in a nutshell. Then from Revelation 13, we have um, another description of the Antichrist. Uh, Men worship the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months, that's three and a half years. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and conquer them. That sounds like that uh, period before the second coming, that unless those days were shortened, even the elect would be lost. But for the sake of the elect, those days uh, will be shortened. Because here it's saying um, that the beast was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months and allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. So that sounds like that same period when, unless it was shortened, the beast, the Antichrist, would have conquered the saints. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. This is why people think it's connected to the one world government, because the Antichrist is going to have authority over every human being on earth, every tribe and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. And everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb that was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. The beast makes the earth and its inhabitants worship it. It works great signs, and by the signs which it is allowed to work, it deceives those who dwell on earth. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let him who has understanding reckon the number of the beast, for it is a human number. Its number is 666. So that's the mark of the beast. That's also the beast. That's the Antichrist. Um, and I also mentioned on an earlier program, and I will, um, 
I will uh, use, use my little toy here. I mentioned on an earlier program that that Mark of the Beast being 666 is kind of cool for, for, for if you're a Jew um, to know that or if you know Hebrew because Hebrew uses letters to represent numbers. Their position in the alphabet defines their numerical value. Um, six, the, the numeral six is therefore the sixth uh, letter of the alphabet, which is a vav, which is a v. And I will um, now show you a little more sophisticated graphic. There you have it. There you have the first 10 letters of, uh, is it 10 or nine letters of the Hebrew alphabet? Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Vav, V. That's the sixth letter, right? Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav. So 666 is Vav, 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 or V, V, V. And his, historically, if you look at the evolution of languages, V and W are the, they're the same letter. As a matter of fact, that's why W, it's actually two V's next to each other. And I, anyway, so W is really VV, and uh, many languages don't have a W. The words that have a W in English have a V. That's probably why, with a heavy German accent, it's V will conquer Poland. It's you know instead of we will, because the W is not is not uh, known. So anyway, so WWW is six six six. That's the punchline. That's the bottom line. So. Maybe this uh, mark of the beast taking over the world is dependent on the technology, the worldwide internet, the uh, worldwide communications technology, which is actually necessary to have a one world government. If you stop to think about it, you couldn't have a one world government with people. I'm going to get rid of that, that, um, that uh, graphic now. You couldn't have a one world government if, if people had to communicate, you know, sending telegrams back and forth or faxes back and forth. Um, it's the instantaneous, effortless worldwide communication, which allows one person to sit on one throne somewhere and, you know, control the entire worldwide web, spider web, encompassing, entrapping all of mankind. You know, what's a spider web? A spider web is this sticky web where any fly that comes in the neighborhood gets stuck to it and imprisoned by that web, right? So... World Wide Web, www.vvv666. You see where I'm going with this. So anyway, so having said all of that, let me, um, <laughs> let me talk about somebody else, which is, I'm not saying this has anything to do with anything, okay? So forgive me. But um, if one wanted to identify a person on earth which is wielding more power than any other individual uh, more power for ill more power to bring about the one world government more power to enslave people more power to um, um, to destroy Christianity to destroy the church I think that one good candidate frankly would be a certain extremely wealthy Jewish Hungarian who I think we all know who I'm talking about and um, let me read a quote now from uh, maybe the same, maybe a different Jewish Hungarian, George Soros, okay? Now, these are quotes, actually, these are his own words from both a New Yorker interview and his memoirs, okay? God in the Old Testament has a number of attributes, you know? Like invisible, I was pretty invisible. Benevolent, I was pretty benevolent all-seeing. I tried to be all-seeing, so I was playing it out. If truth be known, I carried some rather potent messianic fantasies with me since childhood, which I felt I had to control. Otherwise, I might end up in the loony bill. Excuse me. I, otherwise, I might end up in the loony bin. Uh, it's a sort of disease when you consider yourself some kind of God, the creator of everything, but I feel comfortable about it now since I began to live it out. OK, so here we have Soros himself confessing to having basically had these fantasies that he was God, thinking that he was some kind of God, the creator of everything, that he had the attributes of God, 
and that now he feels kind of comfortable about it since he's beginning to live it out. Okay, continuing with his quote. I have always harbored an exaggerated view of my self-importance. To put it bluntly, I fancied myself as some kind of God. My sense of reality was strong enough to make me realize that these expectations were excessive, and I kept them hidden as a guilty secret. This was a source of considerable unhappiness throughout much of my adult life. As I made my way in the world, reality came close enough to my fantasy to allow me to admit my secret at least to myself. Needless to say, I feel much happier as a result. You know, please read these words and tell me how he doesn't have a God complex and how he doesn't think he's God and isn't putting himself on the throne of God, okay? So, so um, boy, I can't believe it. I'm going to have to end sometimes, you know, relatively soon. Um, let me check the comments and see if anyone's complaining yet. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know, I know. Another candidate is, is, is Bill Gates. It's fine. I'm not lobbying for any single candidate, except that actually, to tell the truth, the church fathers unanimously, uh, not that that makes a dogma, but they unanimously said that the Antichrist has to be a Jew because Christ was a Jew and the Antichrist is this uh, diabolical imitation of Christ. So he's going to be a Jew also. And of course, Soros is a Jew and Bill Gates isn't a Jew. So that's really, you know, um, you know, and there's no question that they're animated by the same spirit. So, um, uh, you know, anyway, so I, I'm not going to contest that, whether it's George, uh, George Soros or Bill Gates or whatever. But it's it's kind of really neat uh, what we're seeing in the face of this um, coronavirus the the mask dropping and all of these mechanisms for worldwide control being exposed now i am going i'm going to suggest a uh, hypothesis a possible scenario i'm not going to say that i believe this is the case um in that sense i'm not a conspiracy theorist however um it's a hypothesis i mean who knows uh, in all of the realm of possible um, scenarios that led to the current situation, I, it's hard to dismiss as a possible scenario, which is if, so just imagine it, put your imagination hats on for the moment. So imagine that the coronavirus, which of course was originally called the Wuhan virus, actually came from the virus research lab in Wuhan, uh, uh, considering that the first known cases of it occurred within a couple of hundred yards of the, that virus lab. And in fact, some of those virus lab researchers were disappeared by the Chinese government. I mean, it's all suspicious stuff. Of course, doesn't mean anything certain. So just imagine the possibility that um, it actually was a research project from that lab and was generated intentionally. Um, you might want to Google event 201 if you want to see more about what I'm talking about. So just imagine that. Uh, and by the way, the Wuhan virus lab was funded by the National Institute of Health, by the American government. Not 100%, but they received, a, I think it was over $3 million of funding from the National Institute of Health because the National Institute of Health was doing research on viruses that the uh, federal government shut down because it was too dangerous and it was basically, you know, researching how to create dangerous viruses. I'm not saying that was the only purpose of the research, but it was definitely an effect of the research. So the government ordered to shut down. So the National Institute of Health funneled money to the Wuhan lab in order to continue the research. This is fact. This is not conspiracy theory. Um, uh, it does look, by the way, like Dr. Fauci was involved in that decision. Um, again, research it yourself if you want. I'm not betting my salvation on that fact, but that's what it certainly looked like to me. So anyway, so just imagine that that research didn't begin. Uh, or imagine that the release was intentional. That's the other thing you want to imagine, that, that this was a plan maybe that the release maybe didn't happen exactly when it was supposed to happen maybe it was accidentally released but the plan was to develop a virus that was more contagious 
than any virus have been previously and more fatal than any virus have been previously. This virus, thank God, is not more fatal. As a matter of fact, it's substantially less fatal, it seems, than the swine flu. Um, so anyway, but so they succeeded in it being hyper contagious. They didn't succeed in it being hyper, uh, hyper fatal. Okay, so okay, so let's say this was an, an intentional research project to produce a virus that could produce a global pandemic. Okay, now ask yourself two questions. One question is when did this research begin? Did it begin after Trump was elected? You know, and maybe as a plan to to um, cripple the American economy under Trump, or uh, a plan to cripple Trump's booming economy so he wouldn't be elected, reelected rather. Or does this plan go back to 2014, 2015, way before Trump was even, you know, on the scene as a presidential candidate? And uh, was this plan actually hatched then? And was the plan, of course, everyone expected Hillary Clinton to win the election. We know that you would have made a fortune. I think uh, the evening, the night of the election, the New York Times said it was about a 98% probability, a 99% probability that she would win. So now paint that picture in your head, okay? In like 2015, 2016, 2014, this plan is under development for Hillary Clinton to become president and maybe a couple of years into her presidency for this global pandemic to be released which ha kills tens of millions of people, maybe even tens of millions of Americans, certainly millions and millions of Americans, if the virus had been kind of successful. Then imagine, with a president like Hillary Clinton, what policies might have been put in place with respect to compulsory vaccination, with respect to having to prove that you've been vaccinated, with respect to controlling your movements, with respect to monitoring the movements of everyone in the United States or everyone on earth, even avoid, I mean, think, think about this. If they eliminated cash transactions, you couldn't buy or sell anything without the government knowing whether you were in a store or not, right? Because you'd have to take out your credit card or your chip or whatever to buy something. Um, or you'd have to be logged on to the internet and they would know your location. I mean, think about what a global pandemic resulting in tens or hundreds of millions of deaths would have meant in the power it would have given a malevolent government to institute uh, draconian uh, totalitarian control. Oh, back to, excuse me, I got a little political there. <laughs> back to the scriptures. Um, but anyway, the coming of the Antichrist is one of those um, four things we know for certain. So, um, so anyway, uh, t the trials to come before the end. Let me see. I, I think I've actually covered a lot of territory, even though I've been kind of uh, skipping about a lot. Okay, so I'll read a passage from a, a, an extended passage from Matthew 24. It's Jesus talking about the end times. Uh, what do we know about the trials before the end? I'm, I'm giving a little introduction. I'm, I'm not reading yet from Matthew 24. What do we know about the trials before the end? Uh, a one world government will emerge, right? The Antichrist will, basically everyone on earth will bow down to the Antichrist and no one will be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. So there'll be the emergence of a one world government, totalitarian control. There'll be wars, famines, earthquakes, plagues. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. There'll be persecutions, Christians given up to death, basically executed for being Christians. There'll be a huge natural catastrophes, tidal waves, earthquakes, so forth. Okay, so that's that we know about the trials, the global trials before the end. Now back to Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Okay, so that's the basis of the dogma that the gospel will have been preached throughout the world before the second coming. I'll just repeat that. That's verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world 
as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So the gospel having been preached throughout the world is one of the time clocks which is going to let us know that it's time for the end. Again, I just ask you, think about today in 2020 versus, say, 1950, or, or better yet, 1920. I mean, I mean uh, before satellite radio, before satellite TV, and before the Internet, there were large areas of the globe to which the gospel had not been preached, at least large populations. Uh, China, some in Africa, um, some in the Arab world. However, since with the new technology, with, with the internet, with satellite television, with satellite radio, has the gospel been preached throughout the world? Is there any significant part of the world which has not had an opportunity to hear the gospel? Just think about a hundred years ago, how different that was. You'd have to you know, missionaries would have to go someplace and smuggle in Bibles and, and get little home churches going and get people to spread the news and talk to each other and try to build up this like grassroots evangelization, not this coming down from the heavens, you know, with, with satellite waves and so forth evangelization. So has the gospel been produced, uh, preached throughout the world? Um, so, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the desolating sacrilege spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, that's um, a citation from the book of, of, of Daniel. So when you see the desolating sacrilege spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let him who is in the field not turn back to take his mantle. And alas for those who are with child or those who give suck in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribula tribulation, such as has not been seen from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been shortened, no man would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Then, if anyone says to you, Lo, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Lo, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. I'm just going to put in a little aside. I'm not talking about any contemporary prophet in particular. But we do know from the words of Jesus himself, from the words of St. Paul also, maybe I'll find that citation for later, that one of the signs of the, that the second coming is near is there will be a plethora, there will be a great multiplication of false prophets saying, look here and look there. And maybe even saying, flee into the wilderness or do this or do that. So the question then becomes not, um, is there such a thing as false prophecy and false prophets? We know that there is such a thing and we know that there will be a particular multiplication of them before the second coming. Then our task is to say, how can we distinguish between a true prophet and a false prophet? And if you have an answer to that, please, you know, um, send me a comment with the answer, because that is, of course, the $64,000 question. Uh, but what it does mean is that there's a good reason to um, be discerning, to be discerning, and not to get just swept up by the fact of prophecy. The fact of prophecy is very compelling, but that doesn't mean it's correct. Anyway, okay, back to uh, Matthew 24 and the words of Jesus. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So you don't need any secret knowledge. Um, you know, it's going to be 
from the east to the west across the sky. By the way, that's another thing about uh, prophets. Remember when Jesus was condemned during Holy Week, when he was being tried, he said, Why ask me? I have spoken nothing in secret. I have said everything out loud. Ask my disciples. They've heard everything I've said. You have no need to ask me what I said because I do not speak in secret. Anything that is secret knowledge, that is special knowledge, that you have to do, doesn't sound to me like the way Jesus operates, to tell the truth. I don't think Jesus operates by telling individuals, tell everyone that unless they perform this formula, do this thing, say this new prayer, you know, store up this or store up that, um, then they will not survive the three days of darkness or they won't survive the great tribulation or so forth. That doesn't sound to, I mean, as a matter of fact, it's dogma. I'm, I, this is a little bit subtly different, but it's actually dogma that everything you need to know for salvation is in public revelation. By definition, no private revelation is required to be saved. That is a, that's a pronouncement of the church. And I think it is a very wise pronouncement. Of course, it's true. But it's very logical because things would fall apart if one had to correctly discern true prophecy from false prophecy in order to be saved. Because, in fact, no one can discern true prophecy from false prophecy. That's my opinion. I certainly can't. Again, if anyone knows a magic formula, excuse me, I don't want to be disrespectful. But if anyone knows a surefire formula for discerning true prophecy from false prophecy, let me know. But I think the closest thing to such a formula is what's its effect on people's behavior. And is the effect on people's behavior of the prophecy to make them better people, more loving people, more, res more responsible to their daily duty, more responsible to their families and to their vocations, um, then it's leading them on the right path. That's certainly a good sign. And all of the public prophecy that I know of, by the way, like, like Our Lady in Fatima, she didn't say, do this special thing, you know, um, I don't want to sound too flip, but, you know, you have to turn, you know, you have to spin around counterclockwise three times and touch your finger to your nose to be saved or anything like that. She said, pray the rosary, frequent the sacraments, go to confession, meditate on the passion, um, um, you know, stay close to Jesus, feel sorry for Jesus in his suffering, pray for the salvation of souls. She said things that don't separate you from doing the right stuff. Um, you have false prophets. Um, um, I, I don't like to name names because, you know, but you have some prophets that have been condemned by the church. I know they still have fans, so I won't mention their names. Oh boy! But anyway, who have who tell who have told people to leave their spouses, to um, take up you know told men to leave their their wife and take up with another woman, who tell people to leave their jobs and um, you know and and build a cabin in the woods and store up enough food and water for three years and stuff. Um, that tell people, and there have been a lot of these, by the way, that basically tell people that um, the end of the world is coming in a month or two. So quit your jobs and don't worry about anything and run up your credit cards. Uh, Jim Jones was actually one of those. I think David Koresh, too. Those are not Catholic, so it's a little safer for me to name them. Um, so anyway, if a prophecy makes you act irresponsibly, less loving. Oh, and the other thing, by the way, these prophecies do, which is extremely dangerous, is we are the saved. We are the elect. And unless you buy into this prophet, you're doomed. So let me evangelize for this prophet. And then it becomes a kind of us versus them, you know, us versus you, um, you know, a faithful remnant in the wrong sense, uh, kind of a thing. And it becomes a cult. And, um, people who are in, under the influence of the devil 
like nothing more than to be cult leaders. So anyway, and by the way, as long as I'm going down this vein, let me add one more thing, which is false prophets, cult leaders, they don't necessarily know that they're doing the wrong thing. They don't necessarily know that their visions or locutions are spurious. As a matter of fact, I think that they, that they don't know. I think that there is no way for them either, actually, to discern between a correct vision or a false vision. So they are simply, and they could be very saintly people in the sense that they could be extremely pious and holy and well-meaning people who get snookered by the enemy, who, who receive these visions or revelations, excuse me, that are coming in part from the enemy. They may be coming in part from God, by the way. They may have started out with true revelations from God. And then the enemy gets in and gives them some more revelations that then kind of um, lead them into this destructive behavior. It doesn't mean, it, it means you can't tell that they're false prophets because, you know, they they wear red and have sinister beards and glare at people and you know and and frequent strip joints or anything they might be actually very holy religious and that's why the saints and of course saint john of the cross and saint Teresa of avila come to mind have always 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 preached that if you receive any revelation any prophecy any visions flee from it try to suppress it do everything you can to push it away because if it's from god it won't get pushed away but if it's from the enemy it will get pushed away but if you welcome it then the enemy then has permission so to speak to give you you know that that falsity because you're eager for it or you're you're receptive to it if you're resisting it with your will the enemy doesn't have the power to overcome your will um God has more power in that direction. I don't want to get uh, on too thin theological ice, but I think you, you see the drift. Anyway, back to uh, Matthew 24. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Where um, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And now comes Jesus's little reprimand about recognizing the signs of the times from the fig tree learn its lesson as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves you know that summer is near so also when you see all these things you know that he is near at the very gates truly i say to you this generation will not pass away till all these things take place heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So, um, I guess, um, I guess I probably should stop. I should probably stop this. Oh gosh, I hate to stop. I'm going to just read one more, one more passage. Um... I'll have to look it up unless I have it here, which is another description from Jesus of the time of the second coming, because it has a little time clock and it's got to do with the conversion of the Jews being another sign of the times, another sign that the second coming is near. Um, I, I should interject that there is more conversion of the Jews now than there has been probably since apostolic times. There's the Messianic Jewish movement, which was unheard of before 1968 and which is now spread worldwide. In Israel, there is not a town, a town, much less a city, without a Messianic Jewish uh, congregation of Jews who came to faith in Christ, Israeli Jews, actually, who came to faith in Christ and so forth. Um, 
So I think we're seeing a widespread conversion of the Jews. And the conversion of the Jews is, of course, one of the signs that has to precede the second coming. The New Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 674, quote, The glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. So that's the dogma that states it. That, um, that uh, uh, paragraph in the Catechism is based on uh, Romans, 20, uh, Romans 11, verse 25, when St. Paul says, lest you be wise in your own conceits, brethren, I want you to understand this thing. Unless you be wise, lest you be wise in your own conceits, brethren, I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. So the plan was to hold back the conversion of the Jews until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and then will come the flood of um, Jews into the church. And that, until the full number of the Gentiles comes in, sounds a lot like a verse from the words of Jesus in Luke 21, which is the passage I was about to read. Uh, Jerusalem will fall by the edge of the sword, and the Jews will be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So, um, there you have another timeline, okay? Jerusalem will fall by the edge of the sword, literally fulfilled 70 AD when Jerusalem was, was conquered by the Romans. The Jews will be led captive among all nations, literally fulfilled. The Jews were led into slavery by the Romans and dispersed among the entire, across the entire Roman Empire. So they were led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles, literally fulfilled. Jerusalem was held in Gentile hands continually, nonstop, from then until 1967 AD, when Jerusalem, for the first time in 2,000 years, returned to Jewish hands, the old city of Jerusalem. And then Jesus goes immediately into a description of the second coming. The, Jerusalem will fall by the edge of the sword. The Jews will be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there shall be signs in sun and moon and stars, Da, 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 and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So it certainly seems like this is another, um, yet another um, uh, uh, timeline of a way we can tell when we're approaching the second coming. I hope that you uh, bear with me in a moment, for a moment, I think, because um, I have to do something here. Um, because, okay, um, because I have to, I have to prepare for the closing of the show and I don't know what I'm doing as you can tell. So there, I was just preparing for the close of the show. So with that, um, I have come to probably the end of the show. I guess I'll read the, uh, the, uh, paragraph from the Catechism of the Council of Trent. I will try to remember to put up in the description underneath this video, the passages, um, the citations that I'm reading, so you can look them up on your own. It probably would be fun to do if you're into this kind of thing. So from the Catechism of the Council of Trent in the 16th century, the signs of the general judgment. This is from Article 7 on the Creed of the Catechism of the Council of Trent, 16th century. Quote, the sacred scriptures inform us that the general judgment will be preceded by these three principal signs. The preaching of the gospel throughout the world, number one, a falling away from the faith, number two, that's the great apostasy, and the coming of the Antichrist. This gospel of the kingdom, says our Lord, shall be preached in the whole world for testimony to all nations, and then shall the consummation come. The apostle also admonishes us that we be not seduced by anyone as if the day of the Lord were at hand, for unless there comes a revolt first and the man of sin be revealed, the judgment will not come. Now, the one uh, 
event, a sign that has to come before the um, end of the world that I didn't have time to mention was the great apostasy, the falling away from the faith. But maybe since you're watching this video, I can assume that you're painfully aware of the falling away from the faith, the way that the uh, in all of Europe used to be Christendom. It used to be the Holy Roman Empire. Now with the new uh, co constitution of the European Union, they refused even to mention Christianity as a historical fact in the formation of Europe. Um, we know what church attendance is like. We know what mass attendance is like. We know what belief in the real presence is like. We know, uh, frankly, we also even know about the, um, um, the uh, corruption that has infiltrated um, the hierarchy of the church and um, you know, the, the, some of the scandals in the church. But perhaps more, more germane is um, we know that we're living in post-Christian times that, you know, for most of the last 2000 years, the Christian world was expanding and Christianity was spreading to more and more of humanity. And now, you know, it's like when the tide goes from tide coming in to tide going out, you know, now the tide seems to visibly be going out and areas of the world that were Christian are shrinking and becoming less and less Christian, including, of course, you know, France and Italy, Italy, the home of the church, I mean, of, of, of Rome and of the Vatican and everything. Even in Italy, uh, Christianity is, is fading away or is shrinking back like the tide going out. So I have probably 40 minutes of stuff I could talk about and statistics about um, the great apostasy, but probably that's not necessary. So with that, I'm going to end today's show. Um, I'm going to go back, by the way, if you want to hear that music again, if I can master the technology when I end the show, I'll go into a few minutes of again, harp a day chanting over and over again, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can, uh, can master this. Um, uh, master this now, and oops, I like, made that too loud. Sorry, that right. wasn't the plan. The plan was to have it come in gradually. So there we have it. So anyway, I will be um, plan. I plan to do this again uh, Sunday, day after tomorrow, same time, three p.m. Eastern time, and I will continue with. Uh, I think I'll call that talk the demonic in the end times because there's a lot of um, really fun stuff. About, excuse me for finding this stuff fun, but um, fun stuff about just what the enemy will be doing, I guess. I talked a little bit about that, but more about what the enemy is doing, what the enemy does in um, non-Christian religions, what the enemy does in the war against Christianity. Um, and I don't want to give away too much, but a little bit more about demonic religions and their role in the end time. So with that, I am going to fade out. I can't do two things at once here, unfortunately. Um, I am going to fade up the music and I'm going to fade out me. So there's the music. And now, goodbye. Ven Señor Jesús Maranata, ven Señor Jesús Maranata, come Lord Jesus Maranata, come Lord Jesus Maranata, come Lord Jesus Maranata, come Lord Jesus Maranata.